Hi everyone. So I want to continue here talking about this idea of the atomic emission spectrum, how it relates to the structure of the atom. So if you remember that the, you know, so far we've only talked about this idea of the atomic emission spectrum and that the fact that if you have an element um, and it's heated, uh, you know, it like, and it it's usually emits light of a certain color, that light could then be split apart into component light waves. And for an element, it would look, the emission spectrum would look like lines, whereas for a white light, it would look like continuous spectrum. So we're particularly curious about these ones because this comes from specific elements, right? Comes from helium, comes from barium, and so on. So uh, that means that the light is emitted as a result of some changes in the electrons of the helium atoms, the, uh, the electrons in the barium uh, atoms. So if we can model this uh, emission and make predictions somehow of how these lights, these light waves come about, we, you know, that, that model will give us the understanding of what, how atom and how electrons are composed inside an atom. And remember what I said before was that there was this equation called the Rydberg equation, which was developed by Rydberg. He was able to, uh, for the hydrogen atom, come up with an equation that basically allows him to predict all the different wavelengths that you can observe. Again, this is specifically for the hydrogen atom. Uh, so he was able to develop that equation. However, the problem was that he didn't, couldn't quite explain why this RH, which is called the Rydberg constant, why that has to have this value and what, why the N1 and N2 uh, symbols that he put here have to only have uh, integer values, you know, uh, positive integers in this case. So, so that's the thing that we're, uh, we ended with. And so what we want to do now is kind of talk about what models can uh, help us explain the importance of the Rydberg equation. So our model of the atom at the time, the most advanced model, of course, is the Rutherford's model of the atom. Remember that we talked about this in topic two when we talked about the discovery of the electron, the nucleus. And at the time, Rutherford basically uh, came up with a model that, uh, you know, uh, improved upon Thomson's model, the plum pudding model, if you remember that. And what he's saying is that now the atom is, is basically um, modeled as uh, there's a center, and that center contains positive charges, which is the, the nucleus, and contains protons and neutrons. Neutrons were discovered a little bit later. Um, and then he just proposed that electrons are surrounding the nucleus, but in no specific uh, location. So the electrons can be distributed anywhere around the nucleus. There's a couple of problems with this model in terms of um, predicting the atomic emission spectrum. The first one, which is, you know, you can think of it as, 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 as a big or a small problem. One of the problems is that remember that earlier we had this idea that if we want to um, emit the slides, then the idea is electrons are excited to some from the ground state to some excited state and then it comes back down to the ground state and that's when the light is emitted. So if you think about the fact that you have electrons located anywhere within the nucleus, the electrons can be excited to an excited state and it comes back to, again, the original position, right, the ground state of the electrons. If you think about it, that means that there is uh, really no location where the electron cannot be found in which case then what we would expect is if there's an electron at any possible position uh, around the nucleus that means that what we what we should expect is we should expect a continuous spectrum right because you think about the electron being at some location it is excited and comes back to that location but then there could be an electron at another different location there's no location within the around the nucleus that's prohibited that means that overall you should be able to get light of any kind of wave wavelength to appear, if you can get light of any kind of wavelength to appear, that means you should have a continuous spectrum. So that's the first problem uh, associated with this model, the Rutherford model, is that all the elect, you know, the electrons could be located uh, anywhere, and as a result, we would expect a continuous spectrum. But of course, we don't see a continuous spectrum, so that's an issue. The second issue is that this is more of a, a issue that you would understand if you if you uh, have taken physics before. But if not, then you just have to kind of take it. Uh, take me at my, my word for this, that if you were to um, apply Newtonian mechanics, which is the calculation in classical physics, to an object that where you have a negative object uh, or ne negative particle uh, going around and around um, surrounding a positive uh, particle, uh, 
the Newtonian mechanics, again, classical mechanics would predict that this electron would actually spiral downwards towards the nucleus, towards the positive charge, and go inside. And basically, you can make rough calculation, and this would predict that the electron would quickly collapse into the nucleus, and the atom would be destroyed. Okay? Now, we know that that's not true because we see matter existing around us, and matters are comp you know matter is composed of atoms. So we know that atoms don't collapse, uh, but somehow the model uh, uh, that Rutherford proposed would predict that atoms would collapse. So clearly, there's something that's not right about this model. Two pro true problems: one is that the fact that the uh, the electrons can be located anywhere, and secondly is the fact that the electrons would be would collapse if you uh, predict this uh, type of model. So as a result of this uh, inconsistencies in the model of Rutherford, uh, a new model of the atom needed to be developed and the model that was developed was called the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom. Uh, specifically we're talking about the hydrogen atom because that's the kind of simplest atom that you can find one electron, uh, one proton, so it's you know if you can use that and kind of generalize to other atoms which is our polyelectronic, you know multi-electron atoms then uh, we'll be able to hopefully understand the atom a little bit better but we start with this very simple you know uh, atom, the simplest atom possible, the hydrogen atom. So the Bohr model, uh, the, the different kind of uh, points about the Bohr model are written here and I want to kind of mention but you know probably give you a picture of this and the, the the sentences would make a lot more sense, okay? So, the picture that I want to give is this one right here. This is basically the Bohr model, and a lot of you are f probably familiar with this model, have seen it before. This is Niels Bohr. He won the Nobel Prize in 1922 for developing this model, but the model is what we often call the planetary model of the um, atom where you have the nucleus as like the sun in this case, and then you have the electron being you know, planets orbiting uh, around these circular orbits, okay? And what you notice here is that uh, in this case the electron, for example, could be located in this orbit, uh, the electron could be located in this other orbit, okay? But they're restricted, they're restricted to these orbits only. So an, ele an electron, for example, cannot be found in this white space right here. It's only restricted to these circular orbits right here. So that's the first uh, difference between the Bohr model and the Rutherford model and that's kind of the first point I, pu I put up here which is the electrons move around the nucleus in circular orbits. The circular orbits by the way is often called energy levels so you see actually here it says electron energy levels so the word orbit or the word energy level mean the same thing which is basically the location around the nucleus where the electron can be found okay now the electron is not allowed uh, in the Bohr model to be found in these white spaces, right? So if we go back to this, electrons are only allowed to be in these orbits, nowhere else. And that was the only way he could um, basically uh, have a model that explains this atomic emission spectra because as I said earlier, if you have the electron everywhere uh, around the nucleus, like in the Rutherford model, you're then not restricted to having just line, you know, spectrum like this, but you should have a continuous spectrum. But because the electrons are only located at specific orbits as you'll see in a second when they go from one orbit to another they're going to emit light and that light would correspond to just the distance between those two orbits the energy that's being generated as a, as a movement from the two orbits so then would correspond only to one line as opposed to any continuous line now going back to again the uh, picture here uh, so that is the allowed location for the electrons, right? It's only in those specific orbits. And at any given orbit, the energy of the electron is constant. Uh, electron is stable infinitely in that orbit. So they can just keep moving around and around and around. They're not gonna fall into the nucleus as predicted by classical mechanics. So this is something that Bohr uh, sort of made up in to some extent he's he called the electron an infinitely stable particle something that somehow doesn't uh, follow the law of classical mechanics it, it sort of violates the law of classical mechanics in that sense he's saying that the electron is not like other charged particle will, will just fall into the opposite charged particle it will just stay stable even though it's being attracted by the nucleus it's not going to fall into the nucleus so this is something like um a hedge on his part. He's trying to say that the electron 
it's a charged particle, but somehow it's a charged particle that doesn't fit the laws of classical mechanics, okay? But he said that's the only way, if, if, you, if you take that as a given, then you can explain why, you know, we see these, these uh, line spectra, okay? So the third part of this says that, so then he was able to say that each of this energy level is, uh, he calls them n, okay? So each of the orbit is given a, a number n, and basically the lowest energy level is given the value n equals 1, and that's the energy level that's closest to the nucleus. So if you go back to your uh, picture here, this circle right here, this orbit right here would be the n equals 1 orbit. The second one is then would be your n equals 2 orbit. This one would be your n equals 3 orbit, and so on as you go further and further. At some point you have n equals infinity, and at that point, the electron is basically what we call ionized. It's completely removed from the atom. At that point, the hydrogen atom becomes the hydrogen ion, H+. Plus, okay. So this is the ground state because it's the closest one, the most stable state. This is the first excited state, second excited state, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, if the electron, now, now is the, the kind of the important, you know, one of the most useful thing that comes out of this model. He's saying that if the electron, like in this case, goes from n equals 1 to n equals 2, because this is a higher energy state, right, because it's further away from the nucleus, the energy that the electron gets is from its interaction with the nucleus. So the further away the nucleus from the, uh, elect uh, the electron from the nucleus is, then the less stable the electron is. So in order for me to take this electron to go from n equals 1 to n equals 2, I need to put in energy. So electron has to absorb energy to go from... Uh, n equals 1 to n equals 2. That energy could come in from electricity, it could come in from light, it could come in from all kinds of stuff. Um, now, the opposite case, when the electron goes from n equals 2 to n equals 1, it goes from a higher energy to a lower energy state, it has to release energy. Okay, so then that makes sense, right? Again, from thermodynamic perspective, if you go from a higher energy to lower energy, you have to release energy because of conservation of energy. And that energy is what we see as light, okay? So that energy that's released come in the form of light. That light has a specific wavelength. That wavelength you can calculate using the Rydberg equation and the energy of the photons that's being emitted uh, by the electron that's going from, so this should be photons, by the way, energy of uh, photons uh, admitted, uh, emitted, I should say, by electrons moving from one orbit to another uh, can be calculated using the Rydberg equation or vice versa if you're talking about energy that's needed by the electron to be uh, absorbed by the electron to go from low to high level, you can also use the Rydberg equation to calculate it. So what's the Rydberg equation? Well. Uh, what Bohr is saying is the following. The energy of the electron in each orbit can be calculated using this equation. So for example, if I'm interested in energy of uh, the electron in orbit 1, I would just say E1 is equal to negative RH times 1 over N squared, where N in this case is 1. So RH is the Rydberg constant, but it has a slightly different value than what you saw earlier. And so there's only a slight difference between the uh, Rydberg constant value here. You notice that here, the original Rydberg constant that we discussed before when Rydberg proposed this equation was specifically used to calculate the wavelength of the light that showed up on this line spectra. And that has this value right here. Now, in the Bohr model, this equation is used, the constant is used to calculate energy of the electrons that goes from one level to another, either from a higher to a lower or lower to a higher level. So the constant is expressed in energy units, which has this value at that point, 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules, okay? The other requirements are the same. N1 and N2 have to be positive whole numbers. They now correspond to these orbit values or energy level values. And N2 has to be bigger than N1 if you want emission, okay? So En is the energy of the electron at a particular orbit. Again, like I said, if I want to know how much energy electron has at orbit number one, I would just put in one right here, okay? In the next video, we're talking about how to calculate the energy for electron transition.